I think we're going to switch now from um, you know this long-term vision of the future and how we cope with problems that uh, we face in the decades ahead to um, a, a different kind of problem where we're looking at um, systems that were built, infrastructure that was built to uh, support the, the growing population here in Southern California, one of the first big systems, and how we deal with um, with the problems that evolve from that downstream of having built it as, as we try to continue to um, to make it all work effectively. And the guy that's going to speak about that for us, I'm speaking in this case of the, um, of the uh, Los Angeles Aqueduct, which, um, as you probably all know, was built in 1913. It was one of the first major, uh, well, in that time, I think it was the largest um, civil engineering project in the country. Um, and was one of the first major uh, water uh, transportation projects or transportation, that's not a water word. Anyway, <clears throat> which, which made Los Angeles in many ways uh, what it is today. And, uh, and of course, you all know that project has at the same time uh, been tied to a lot of controversies. One of the most recent ones having been the dust issues in, um, in uh, Owens Valley. And so Marty Adams, who is the um, Director of Water Operations for uh, Los Angeles Water Power is going to come and talk to us about that. Marty is one of the most dynamic and interesting characters in the water department management portfolio. Marty, come on up. Good uh, still morning by a few minutes. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Marty Adams from Department of Water and Power in Los Angeles. Um, I hope Rhodes didn't oversell me. Uh, well, he did call me a character, so that was good. Um, but he also said that uh, there might have been a few impacts when we constructed the aqueduct 99 years ago, which I think is, as we've found over the last 99 years, is, uh, is uh, it would be nice with only a few impacts associated with it and only a few things we have to deal with. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is uh, some of the efforts that we've made, um, particularly in the last couple of decades, in regards to uh, maintaining uh, not only our watershed, but also the uh, quality of the environment in the Owens Valley and the things that we've had to do to mitigate uh, the water gathering activities of the city of Los Angeles. Uh, by a brief intro, I guess to tell you in the aqueduct, the aqueduct is 100, 100 years old uh, next November. So uh, this, this coming November 13th, what was the, this November 11th, pardon me, will be its 99th anniversary. So we are about to embark on uh, the 100 year celebration. We're going to have a year long celebration because when the LA aqueduct was constructed, it really was the opening of, 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 of big development in Southern California, certainly for the city. And then as my friends here from Metropolitan Water District, who I see, as they know, uh, you know, some of those efforts parlayed into the Colorado, Colorado River Aqueduct, which was also the basis for forming Metropolitan and, and a lot of the growth of Southern California. So this was a, a huge undertaking, uh, hard to imagine by our, our predecessors many, many years ago. But it's something that we're proud of and uh, it's something that we deal with every day in trying to do our best job managing it. Make sure I have the right slide here. Does that work? Okay, the, uh, the, what I'd like to talk about today are uh, the basic topics about the water system real briefly, just a little overview of the system and how it works. Um, talk about our watershed management goals, uh, in particular the Eastern, Eastern Sierra Nevada watershed, and then the environmental restoration programs that we've undertaken. And uh, talk about controversy and, and what's happened with the aqueduct. Uh, I didn't realize that the aqueduct forming in the city of LA's water activities probably drove a number of laws in the state. Uh, most of LA's rights go back to 1907. Uh, a lot of the uh, rights that we appropriated. It was in 1914 that the state decided that they wanted to have some jurisdiction over those water rights. And so we have a lot of pre-1914 water rights, but uh, 1914 laws were passed in, in many cases because of LA's activities. 
Um, likewise, the second aqueduct was completed in 1970, which is the same year that CEQA started. And so that drove a lot of changes. And then uh, we've seen other changes regarding uh, just water law and property law in relationship to the city's activities because the city went off and did efforts in an area of the state uh, before the state had really a lot of protective laws in place. Um, the city of L.A. is about uh, 464 square miles. Uh, it's a large area. All of San Fernando Valley, except the city of San Fernando, is part of the city, city of L.A. Uh, most of the, the Central Basin area, you have Santa Monica and Beverly Hills and, and West Hollywood, some other cities that are not part of Los Angeles. But L.A. is, all, uh, is, is a very vast area. It goes by you know many other small sub-names that are all part of the city of Los Angeles, including what we call the shoestring that goes down to San Pedro to connect the city uh, with the harbor. And within this, there's about 126 surface zones. All the, all the different colors on the map are different surface zones. And it's been viewed as one of the most complex water systems in the world. Uh, we have over 7,000 miles of pipe in the city streets. Uh, there are um, uh, over 700,000 service connections, and we have you know hundreds of tanks and reservoirs, pump stations, and treatment facilities that uh, that make up the city distribution system. So it's a very large and complex network, and uh, one of the challenges is the elevation differences. Um, interestingly, um, as we talk about the aqueduct, the aqueduct comes into the city at the very top end, um, the very little blue speck at the very very north end of the city is where the aqueduct comes in. That's also where the West Branch of the state water project arrives at Metropolitan's Jensen plant, we can move water down the aqueduct by gravity from the Mono Basin all the way through that location, through the Santa Monica Mountains, all the way to San Pedro. So it's quite an accomplishment, and we are proud of the fact that we have the use of gravity for so much of our water supply. About 75 to 80 percent of the water is moved by gravity through the city. Our water supplies uh, we have local water supply, and if you go back to the very, very early days, uh, the L.A. River was the water supply for the city of L.A., and uh, I don't think you'd want that to be your water supply necessarily today, but uh, that was our supply. Uh, now the, the remnants of the L.A. River in terms of underground water is still a local water source, but groundwater contamination is becoming a challenge increasingly every year so that our, our well capacity has dropped off and is something that we're looking to, uh, to remedy. But most of our water is imported into the city. It's actually about 88% of the water comes into the city that's imported. Uh, on the very left is the state water project that uh, we buy water from Metropolitan Water District, who's our local wholesaler. Then the Colorado River Aqueduct coming in from the east, which is owned by Met. And then the LA Aqueduct, which is the oldest that the city grew on coming down from the eastern Sierras. The variability in the supplies has been uh, a critical issue for the city. Uh, if you look back in the past, the green is the L.A. aqueduct, and you see that when I started work 28 years ago with the department, about 70 to 75 percent of the supply was L.A. aqueduct supply. And then you had local groundwater. It was a fairly fixed amount. And then we bought water from Metropolitan uh, to just make up the difference. And then you'll see a little bit of recycled takeoff in the, in the, in the later years, but you'll see a huge growth in metropolitan supply, and that's in response to two things. One is weather changes. So as the climate changes, so does the amount of water that we have to purchase. And the problem with that is that you know, when it rains, it pours everywhere. And so in the years that we have a lot of water, everybody else has a lot of water. Uh, and the years that we don't, nobody else does either. So that becomes a, a, a tension on the, on the state water systems overall. And then also the other issue for those, for those waters is that over the last 20 years, we've steadily lost supply down the L.A. aqueduct, which I'll get to in a moment, but as part of the mitigation projects and part of court settlements. And so the aqueduct supply is permanently reduced, and so that water is being made up by water that we're purchasing from MET, which is affecting all the other water customers in Southern California and, and probably the state as a whole. This is just the current split. So where that 35% L.A. aqueduct was 70%, uh, within the last two to three decades, and that's reduced. And then the local groundwater is a small sliver that we're hoping to increase, and the bulk of the water is water that we have to purchase like uh, many other communities in Southern California. What's changed in the aqueduct is that if you look historically, the actual number, uh, the very top line, the long-term average was just under 460,000 acre-feet of water, and that was what we took uh, for the prime years in the, in the 70s and 80s. And then we've had a number of projects that have reduced that, that amount. Uh, the little yellow band at the top is E&M projects, which 
when I joined, uh, took over the aqueduct three years ago, I, people had to remember what E&M was, this enhancement and mitigation. It's a code name. And so uh, we have about 26 E&M projects that, that were a result of a water agreement with Inyo County that was part of a, a settlement of a, of a long court case. And there's about 12,000 acre feet that's lost to E&M projects. The projects actually take a lot more water than that, but that's water that is not being replaced in the aqueduct. Then we have uh, the Mono Lake, and Mono Lake was a decision where we, we uh, in the 1940s, we started taking water from the Mono Basin. Uh, that was changed by a decision by the State Water Resources Control Board, so we lost almost 75,000 acre feet back to Mono Lake to have the lake gain elevation. The next green ban is Owens Lake. Owens Lake is a project I'll talk about. We're losing uh, quite a bit of water there, about 95,000 acre feet a year. And then the Lower Owens River Project, also known as LORP, takes about 20,000 acre feet of water. And then we have some reductions in groundwater pumping for environmental reasons. And it's left us with the kind of, well, it's blue on my sheets, it's kind of purple there. Uh, the bottom band is the export to LA. So where we used to export 460,000 acre feet of water, the exports down the aqueduct right now are just under 230,000. So it's just a little under half the supply. And so some of this has been by court decision, some has been by agreement. Um, some, is, uh, uh, some has been just by uh, environmental issues that we've had to deal with up in the Owens Valley. But it's, it's something that's uh, it's a pressing issue, and it's an issue for Los Angeles. And the effects of that issue become an issue for everybody else who needs imported water in Southern California. One thing we do on our land is to try to make the, the best of the situation is try to, act, to manage the land um, you know, for all the, all the needs. Uh, certainly, maintaining water supply to the city is, is paramount to us. Uh, the, uh, this is the most cost-effective water source. Um, it historically, was the lowest price water source, but now uh, that we've you know lost some of the volume of water, we have a lot more projects. It's not always the cheapest water source, but it's one that the city owns, city has rights to, and is very important to us. The other thing is to protect water quality. The aqueduct has historically been uh, very pristine water. Um, unlike a lot of other areas, there's very little biological uh, influence on the water supply compared to, say, the Sacramento Delta. So the water is uh, is in good condition coming down. Um, I'll give it, I'll, I'll, we'll go ahead and come clean on. The only thing that water really does have is arsenic, and uh, arsenic is uh, is an ongoing issue. If you if you go to Mammoth and you hear about the volcanoes, or you're sitting in the hot springs, you're sitting in all the arsenic. So um, you know that's the water is the you're coming up in the hot springs and such. And so that is the one particular issue that we have to deal with on the aqueduct. But for the most part, the water is very clean. Matter of fact, till 1986, it was only treated with chlorine. It was never filtered uh, until that point because the water was was in such good. condition condition coming down and so finally with the, uh, the uh, with the you know the clean water uh, act and that we had to uh, provide filtration we also are really key on promoting biodiversity um, the valley uh, Owens Valley is a it's a great place uh, the eastern Sierra is very different than the western Sierra the western Sierra has more you know pine forests and such eastern Sierra is more sparse very rugged mountains but it's a fabulous area and we're very concerned that uh, that the biodiversity uh, remain there. It's a big tourist area. Um, there's actually a lot of folks that that will, uh, particularly folks you see in the Owens Valley from Europe. They take a drive. They go to Vegas. They want to drive through Death Valley. They want to go see Mount Whitney within Inyo County, which is the second largest geographic county in the state after San Bernardino. But there's only 18,000 people that live there. You have the highest point in the continent and the lowest point. You have Death Valley and, and Mount Whitney. So, um, and there's a, a lot of, of, of points of interest there. You have the ancient bristlecone forests that go back, uh, the bristlecone pine forests that go back thousands of years. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that attract people as well as the, the, the habitat and the wildlife. We also work to protect and restore the habitats. Uh, this has been a big issue to try to uh, make the valley uh, it back to what it was once. Uh, there's a lot of thoughts, and in, in if you read some of the water lore, you think that L.A. dried up the Owens Valley. You know, the Owens Valley looks almost like it did 100 years ago right now. It looks almost like no one was there, and that's been one of our goals because it protects the water supply and it protects the habitat. And so that is really our goal, and then also to protect the, the threatened and endangered species, some of which are present in the valley. It's not a whole lot, but that is an issue that, that we work with all the other uh, wildlife uh, groups with. 
this uh, just shows, this is a little hard map to see, but if you look at the far black outline, in terms of land ownership, we own 314,000 acres of land. It's just about 500 square miles of land um, up north of the city. So this stretches from the Owens Valley up into Mono Basin. If you're in the Owens Valley and you're driving 395, basically from the base of the fan on one side to the base of the fan on the other side, everything that's flat on the valley floor belongs to the city of Los Angeles other than a couple farms and the areas in the towns uh, like Lone Pine, Independence, uh, Big Pine, and, and Bishop until you get uh, past the Owens Gorge and then there's a lot more private ownership. So the city of LA bought up that property and within that there's six sub watersheds. Most of the land is open to public use. Anywhere from 75 to 90 percent of the city's property is open to the public and, and enjoyed by the public on a regular basis. In terms of our first set of issues to deal with, uh, the Mono Basin uh, is about a 750 square mile drainage area. Uh, it, it collects water from five streams toward Mono Lake. Uh, the city in 1941 diverted the water from four of those streams, uh, Parker, Walker, Rush, and Levining Creeks, and put that water in, uh, in Grant Lake Reservoir. Grant Lake is the highest reservoir we have in the system for as far as going north, and then brought that water through a tunnel through the uh, Mono Craters into the upper Owens River. And so we brought water from a different basin into the Owens River ba Basin. Mono Lake itself is a very salty lake, much like Great Salt Lake, um, but it's been designated a, a, a standing national resource for water because of the migratory waterfowl that go there and the, and the bird life there. This is a shot of actually Rush Creek drainage. Uh, at the very top, very left corner, you can see Grant Lake and the Rush Creek drainage. Um, there was a time that Rush Creek was dried up by the department altogether, and it's been one of the m major focal points of, uh, of uh, restoration for us. Um, this is pictures of Levining and Rush Creeks today, where we have uh, major habitat restoration going on and major fishery restoration. We've spent millions and millions of dollars on fish studies and uh, with state-appointed stream flow scientists to implement good flows. One of the keys for stream flows is to make sure you have the, the right highs and the right lows. Uh, we want to make sure that the fish are able to live in the streams and grow without being stressed. At the same time, you have to have high flows to allow sediment transport and to allow undercutting of banks and, and natural tree falls and stuff to create the kind of pools that the fish need. Rush Creek now was described to me by a fishing game biologist as probably having more brown trout than anywhere else in the state. So it's been a great success. Now we're trying to get those fish to gain some weight, become a trophy fishery. All this is being done within the water allotment that the city has, uh, but it's being a change in the flow pattern. So we're, we were going to a lower low flow, a higher flushing flow, and then we're responding differently every year based on whether it's a wet or dry uh, uh, precipitation year. This is just another picture of Owens Lake, which is again the saline lake. It's the water diverted away from Owens Lake, uh, the part of Mono Lake that has uh, that has caused the, the controversy. So where originally we took nearly 100,000 acre feet from that basin, we now take about 16,000 acre feet from that basin. The rest of it goes to Mono Lake until the lake recovers. It's about nine feet short of its target. And at the point when it reaches its target, hopefully we'll have some increase in exports for the basin, but it could be another 20 years off before that happens. But in the meantime, the restoration activities continue, and we're about to make some improvements at Grant Lake to allow to uh, be able to accommodate the kind of fish flows that the scientists would like to see. The next area is Upper Owens River. Upper Owens River is the area between... Um, basically between uh, where Owens River starts when the Mono Craters Tunnel come in and uh, down through Crowley Lake. Lake Crowley, great trout fishery, is the largest reservoir in the LA aqueduct system. Uh, it actually holds about half of the water supply for the whole city of LA. There's been a number of programs that are focused around, around uh, Crowley uh, and, uh, and the ranching in that area. One of the keys we found is that uh, in terms of the ranching, the timing of the grazing and how the livestock's distributed makes a huge difference on what happens with the pasture lands. It's been a tremendous effort to try to re reconstitute the pasture lands and the stream bank conditions, enough so that we actually received the Golden Trout Award from Cal Trout uh, several years ago in response to improvements on Convict, McGee, uh, Mammoth Creeks and the Upper Owens River. Um, if you heard about our Mammoth Creek controversy, Mammoth Creek is uh, an issue where we're dealing with the town of Mammoth on water rights right now, but that's that's part of the uh, the uh, area up here. There's a uh, and as an example, there's a ranch called Anaya Ranch. Anaya Ranch had some moderate cattle grazing. We've actually made an agreement with the ranchers; they're no longer grazing their property. They've reduced irrigation. 
they've corrected their stream and creek flows back to the Owens River, and then we buy the water from them, and they're seeing the fishery improvements that they wanted to see. So we're, when we see land that's consistent with good fishery improvements and in controlled grazing we're seeing improvements in the water quality we're seeing improvements in the runoff and the amount of water that gets to the river area the owens gorge is a uh, another area of uh, of tremendous change uh, when uh, Crowley Lake was built, uh, there was an agreement. Uh, it was called the Hot Creek Hatchery Agreement. It was uh, basically we uh, built a fish hatchery at Hot Creek for fishing game, and they allowed the dam to go up without a fish ladder around it. And so the upper Owens Gorge was dried up. It was dry from uh, uh, about 1953 until the early 90s. And in 1991, we actually had a pipeline rupture, and it rewatered the upper, uh, the, the middle portion of the gorge. And so after that point, we had to, we had uh, fish established in the gorge and we had to continue flows so we've had a, a in uh, working with the department of fish and game a concerted effort to uh, create a kind of a wetlands and habitat area in the middle of the gorge we have a low flow condition and then a flushing flow where we've actually in a three-year period uh, reestablished habitat and a brown trout fishery in the middle gorge area there is some impact from lost hydropower uh, but it's not major at this point and uh, we're, we're still recovering all the water at the end of the gorge uh, the gorge was dried up strictly for hydropower it used to be part of the the system the aqueduct of the river coming down toward the aqueduct um, but the Owens Gorge is a is a is a interesting spot one of the things they'd like to see this in terms of uh, restoration some people would like to see the existing fishery others would like to see a trophy fishery but if you have a trophy fishery it takes different kind of scouring flows and you have to remove different kinds of sediments at this point we're working with fish and game because there's such a wetlands established that if we have the higher flushing flows then some of the wetlands will be wiped out. And so we're having to be careful that we don't have to mitigate the mitigation. And so I'm sure you've all done that a few times. So uh, so we're, we're, we're taking a very careful approach. And one of the keys is having the right agreements in place that, that everybody fully understands that if this is the goal, that the con there's certain consequences associated with that goal. And some of the other, you know, some not every good thing can coexist together. You have to kind of pick the picture you want to see. And at this point, they want to see the the gorge restored with higher flows. And so we're going to go to a, a new flow regime, which will ideally establish some of the more historical fisheries in the in the area. The Middle Owens River is uh, the area below Pleasant Valley Dam at the south end of the gorge, and it goes down to. Uh, uh, where we have our aqueduct intake. Uh, this area is where most of the people live. There's a lot of recreation. Um, there's a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of activity on department lands. Uh, in the ranch lands there, we have about 12 campgrounds, a couple of golf courses. There's fish hatcheries all on department property. Um, there's uh, been a lot of restoration along the riverbanks. We've created the best willow fly catcher habitat in the western United States, and all that's been done basically by controlling grazing controlling uh, the distribution of cattle, creating corridors along the waterways where and, and, and alternate ways for the cattle to, to have water. There's a lot of, uh, of, of uh, cattle trough and, uh, and livestock uh, uh, troughs that they can drink from so they're not standing in the creeks, not standing in the, in the, uh, in the river itself. And so this really changed the, the riparian uh, vegetation and the pasture land that's abutting the river and the Owens River. And that's allowed a lot of the, the, the native vegetation to take hold. It's a reduced erosion. It's improved the water quality. And with that has come improvements in habitat. And so we've seen uh, great, great strides in that area. And with this, we've actually got a, uh, a Owens Valley Land Management Plan. Uh, on our properties, we have 59 different ranch leases. And each, each ranch has its own customized plan. And that ranch plan tells them how to operate their land, where cattle can and can't go, how they rotate cattle through the area, how uh, grazing is, is proportional to the amount of, of uh, plant growth in the area when it gets to a certain percentage and they have to rotate. And uh, working closely with the ranchers who, for much of the, of the valley floor, about 240,000 acres, they are the caretakers of Department of Water and Power property. So the key is to have them caretake that property in a way that works with the environment so that the cattle, which has been historic, uh, activity up in that area, the cattle ranching, is consistent with uh, at the same time protecting the fish and wildlife issues up there. 
The Lower Owens River project is a, uh, I understand it might be one of the, uh, probably the longest river restoration projects ever undertaken. Uh, with this project, uh, when the Lower Owens River is where the LA Aqueduct diverted the Owens River itself. So just north of the town of Independence, um, the, the river, the, the Owens River was this natural flow, and then there was a, actually a wood timber dam put up at the town, right at the diversion structure. And then the river became uh, basically a straight man-made river for a number of miles and became a concrete line channel and it worked its way to LA and that's where William Mulholland decided that that was the break point where the water was falling too fast toward Owens Lake which was a terminus uh, a terminus lake and so he basically followed a very slightly falling topo line from that point all the way down to the city of LA to where the water came in the cascades coming down well the cascades weren't there the first aqueduct was uh, the low cascades on the hill by the five freeway in Silmar and so he basically followed that topographic line with with the, some tunnels through the uh, through the canyons all the way down to L.A. from the point, but below that point there was uh, the river was dried up, and so the project that we agreed to do was to restore the Lower Owens River and and be able to have uh, have uh, recreation down there as well as manage the habitat so that it would restore uh, reestablish particularly warm water fish uh, fishery. I did see the latest report; they said four thousand bass per mile in this river now i went out there i have to tell you and i looked around and i thought okay every 14 inches there's a fish well, i didn't see anything so i realized they probably were counting the little ones so <laughs> but but there are uh, there are fish taking in the area and so uh with the project the top picture was before it's basically old dried up river channel and then the bottom picture is, is current and uh, and during the summertime and spring and summer, it's all greened up. And and one of the issues is we have we have a nice low flow, but then you have to deliver high flows to get some some uh, flushing down the river to try to limit the tule growth. But most importantly, as the 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 uh, willows. Um, and, we'll, and the cottonwoods will drop seeds, we have to provide flushing flows that'll get that water up on the banks to get those trees to grow. And so we're starting to, to see some reestablishment of, of the mature trees, which will also provide some shading for some of the things like the, like the, uh, um, like the reeds and stuff that are growing in the, in the tules that are in the channel. And it'll start to shade some of those out. But this was a 62 mile river restoration project. So we rewatered 62 miles of river that had been dry since 1913. It happened in 2006, and it's really remarkable looking today. Where that water ended up ultimately, historically, was in Owens Lake. Owens Lake was another salt lake, uh, much like uh, Mono Lake, um, and it was down at the very south end of uh, right by, by Lone Pine. The town of Lone Pine would be just to the northwest here, just in the top left corner. And the Owens Lake was about a 110 square mile area. It was just it was a terminus lake, and not very deep. And uh, it was, a, but it was a, a place where waterfowl would would migrate through, and there was some permanent wildlife that lived in that area. When the city of LA diverted the aqueduct, um, it basically led to the drying up of Owens Lake. Uh, this has uh, been a tremendous issue for the city because the, what it did was it caused the alkali flats to emit dust on windy days, and there are a lot of high wind days. Uh, matter of fact, the the we were looking at the high winds that the hurricanes had and uh the high winds that the hurricanes had are the, are the, just recently are the same winds that we're controlling dust on at owens lake so it's uh it's it's remarkable the the what we've what we've had to deal with out there um on owens lake we are doing a lot of the work with flooding and some amount with vegetation um we actually have about 40 three mile well 42 miles right now of dust controls constructed on the lake so owens lake is 42 miles of area that we've altered to to control dust where we've been ordered to do so it's been at a cost of 95 95,000 acre feet of water a year now 95,000 acre feet of water is a little more than the city of san francisco uses so the water that's equivalent to the city of san francisco is being placed on owens lake right now for dust control so it's a, it's a it's a lot of water. It's probably about forty five to fifty million dollars of replacement water every year. My friends from Met, you're welcome. <laughs> Helping your budget there. So so this has been a, a, a large issue for us. Right now, there's three ways to control dust: um, shallow flooding, which in, includes both ponds and then also kind of a called lateral shallow flood, where we have kind of marshy looking surface. 
vegetation use and also gravel um, all the way all the methods are expensive the city's expended about 1.2 billion dollars to date controlling the dust on Owens Lake um, and and also operating and maintaining that effort and included the hiring of 60 new people to manage the lake and the constructing of another yard and so it's a it's a major uh, major major undertaking for us we are trying to create a better future at Owens Lake. Um, part of it is to transition some of our flooded areas into a meadow area, and we're seeing some success with that and working toward a master plan where, uh, where we might be able to generate a better final product that's not so water intensive and still takes care of the habitat values at the lake. Uh, most recently, if you've seen in the paper, we decided that the city of LA has probably met all of its legal commitments. There, are, there is dust created by the city's diversions of water and those dust that's natural in the Owens Valley. And if you go back to every article written since the first settlers arrived in 1834, you'll find that dust has been a historic issue that people have had to deal with since they first settled the region. And so um, the LA's, uh, Los Angeles has recently actually um, been forced in a situation where we actually had to file a, a federal lawsuit trying to limit uh, the the extent of its dust control responsibilities at the lake to what it's really due to the city's activities and not what's due to Mother Nature, but this is a a key undertaking for us. It's a it's a hotbed of contention right now. But at the same time, while we're trying to draw the line on where the city's responsibilities end, we're very proud of what we've accomplished. We've we've created tremendous habitat. Um, we brought the waterfowl back to the lake. Um, I've been to the lake six times in the last four weeks uh, with everyone from the speaker to the assembly on down and uh, there's you know tule elk and and other things in the lake there's a, a complete revitalization so um, these things can be done that they all cost water and and uh, the the lake is a place where water is used and, and is lost some of the other mitigation projects are a place where water is just rerouted and the lands are used differently but um, what, what, what we'll see, what we see in the lake and as well as the Owens Valley right now is that uh, the, the valley has been pretty much restored to the way it was about 100 years ago and, uh, and very successfully because of the management programs and the working with the local ranchers. So in conclusion, I just want to point out that the, the city of LA and the Water and Power were committed to having effective watershed management program. Um, you know, the activities have enabled us to, to, res to maintain the habitat values up there while uh, continuing to have good water quality and as much uh, uh, water import to the city as possible. We know that the adaptive approach is is uh, definitely needed. We have a lot of groups we work with, uh, both regulatory agencies as well as uh, local environmental groups. Are, we work hand-in-hand -hand with these folks. Um, there's no doubt there's challenges. Anytime you mix habitat and, and ecosystem and recreation, you obviously have conflicts immediately. And so trying to deal with those, trying to confine recreations within the proper boundaries, trying to limit access where it needs to be limited, uh, and, and working uh, you know, hand in hand with the local stakeholder groups, has become very important um, to the success. Uh, we've had some real measurable outcomes. We continue to do a lot of monitoring. Uh, the staff up in the Owens Valley that deals with environmental issues. When I started work, there were three people up there that did biology work, there's 22 now. And so it's a significant investment in, in maintaining uh, our environmental goals. But uh, we know that the healthy environment is key to having a good water supply and certainly key to us having the ability to import the water that the city needs. So with that, I know it's getting toward lunchtime, and I will wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Mario.